Hey, welcome back to another episode of Law and Crime Report. I'm your host, Bob Bianchi. I'll be taking it for the next hour. The House managers presented their opening statements yesterday before the Senate, who will act as jurors in the trial of Donald J. Trump, our former president. It was nothing but an excellent presentation, even by the estimations of the Republicans that watched it. And we saw some new footage and new information that the public had not known before. We had also Stacey Plaskett, who was a delegate from the Virgin Island Islands, who had a prominent role introducing much of that evidence. Let's take a look. Entry, multiple capital entries. 1318. And 12 to 50, we're coming around uh, from the south side. Be advised, let's be attended. Intel 1, be advised, you got a group of about 50 uh, charging up the hill on the west front, uh, just north of the, of the stairs. Uh, they're approaching the wall now. After attempting to dismantle the outermost perimeter, the rioters did everything in their power to storm past the police and into the Capitol. And that's just a snippet of some of the audio transmissions that went on with the harrowing efforts of the Capitol Police Department that were constantly brought out over and over again, stuff we'd never heard before. We got two great guests that are with us today to break this all down. The great Julie Rendleman out of New York. She was a deputy bureau chief of the homicide unit with many high profile cases. She has a criminal defense practice, a law office as a Julie Rendleman, and she is a law and crime legal analyst and is all over the place. In fact, I've got a bunch of things here, Julie. There's a lot of like superb this, tend that, and the other. So welcome to the show. It's always great to have you on. And Dan Shore from New York as well, a former New York ADA like Julie and Inspector General, Title IX Civil Rights and Misconduct Investigator and Adjunct Professor at Fordham Law School, and also a law and crime legal analyst. Boy, you guys got a lot of the same credentials. Uh, welcome to the show, guys. <laughs> Mine are much running similar circles. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm nervous, but you know what? We two New York people gets one Jersey guy. I'm willing to take that on. <laughs> Actually, we talk about one of our famous Jersey guys in the later episode part of this uh, show, Bruce Springsteen. But let's get right to this. Uh, Capitol Police uh, video was riveting. The transmissions were riveting. Uh, the delegate Stacy Plaskett did an amazing job. I'm talking. Forget about politics here. I'm talking. Julie Rendleman about presentation, about how prosecutors or people uh, like what we're doing here, even though it's not a criminal trial. Boy, oh boy, I could not believe how fine tuned and well oiled this machine was from one speaker to the next and to the other. What were your thoughts, Julie? So it's funny, I was thinking back to when I first started trying cases and how literally I had maybe a picture um, that I could ask to post or ask for the jury to be handed. Um, I don't even think we had a screen. And now you see these incredible presentations that do wonders for um, prosecutors who basically are trying to not just present, get someone in the room when the events happen, but get them to fully understand, understand the timeline events of events. And it was so beautifully captivated terrifying. It actually, in some senses, put you um, in the mind of the Capitol Police as they're dealing with uh, the individuals coming in. I thought it was absolutely brilliantly done. Um, and it's something that, I'll be honest, prosecutors' offices around the world should be looking at, which is scary for us defense attorneys, in their next cases and making sure um, that the juries really, jurors really understand what they're dealing with when they're dealing with the case. Yeah, and Dan, you know, to Julie's point, uh, uh, the way that they put it together, but also the seamlessness behind the scenes of the technology people, because mm -hmm. I could tell you personally, when I do summations, and I, I remember having one case where we were doing a lot of the uh, video stuff, and I'm like, if this thing breaks down, someone's losing a job. But it went <laughs> off really, really, really well. 
Dan, I'm curious because I know that you're 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 really good with this kind of stuff. Do you think the articles of impeachment should have added a little more? Like, I'm just curious why they didn't go after the part where they were hammering yesterday about the president, former President Trump's failure to respond to the riot as it was incurring. So instead of having to prove the intent to create in, in, uh, incitement of violence, they could go back to the idea that he did not fulfill his constitutional obligations to support and defend the Constitution against enemies, both foreign and domestic. Why was that not a specific count? And by the way, Dan, when you answer that, it's to block this argument that's being made by the Republicans on the other side that are saying it's unconstitutional to go forward and you can't prove what his intent was. Wouldn't that have been a lot easier, Dan? Well, the House managers used that, or the House, when they voted the impeachment, they used general language and the charges incitement of insurrection. And I, I think it was important for them to keep it simple because if they start fleshing out language, people are going to say, why didn't you include this? Why didn't you include that? And it's really clear what he's being charged for. It's really clear what the evidence is. You went through and Julie went through how clear the layout of the plan was that he was telling people to come to D.C. It's going to be wild, he said. Then they had the rally. He told people to go to the Capitol. He said he was going to go to the Capitol with them, even though he didn't. But to your point about what he failed to do afterwards, some of the most damning evidence against former President Trump is what he did while the riot was going on, sending out that video where he again complained about a stolen election, attacking Mike Pence on Twitter while Mike Pence's life was in danger, which the House managers showed the timeline of those, um, the message and Mike Pence having to flee the Senate floor around the same mm -hmm. time. And then finally, his tweet at the end of the riots where he said, this is what happens when an election is stolen. So I think they wrap that all into that charge of incitement of insurrection. OK, guys, I want to ask you this question. There's a lot of debate and I can't believe how transactional we have become where there's an argument that we know that the Senate is probably not going to convict. Um, that seems to be like, so why go through this? And I couldn't help but think, Julie Rendleman, yesterday that that something needs to be recorded for the purposes of history, if not a lot, just for the fact that there's a court of public opinion out there, but people really didn't have all the connective tissue and all the dots connected. And at least that this is at least some measure of accountability, even if in the end, it's not a conviction uh, for the president. What do you think? I agree. You, you know, I, I think two points. One is I'll say is, you know, I was at the doctor's office and I was watching the video and a lot of the video I hadn't seen. I literally was at the doctor's office and yelled out at one scene um, during the time when uh, the woman was shot when she was going through the window. I'd never seen that actual uh, footage uh, or at least that angle. And I was like, this is something that the United States, the people that live here need to see and know. Um, and mm -hmm. so it, you know, this is something that, it, in a sense, is more for the community at large. Um, at the end of the day, keep in mind, it, while we don't believe um, that the Senate will, that, that they'll vote his against him, you never know people's minds have been changed in the past. Um, and so it, while we assume that's going to happen, we, we don't ever know for sure. There is some argument also to say, though, it, it, which concerns me, is that, again, if they don't vote um, for it, then um, are people going to start to say that once again, it's just political, wasting their time. This is the second time they tried to do it and they were unsuccessful. Um, and so, you know, I hope that people understand how important it is um, for us all to see exactly what really went on that day and what former President Trump's involvement was uh, in what happened. Yeah, I, I think irrespective of a conviction that the public at large, at least a substantial part, are going to say it was worthy because of the information that's coming out that they did not know before. Guys, let's also talk about Eric Swalwell, who is also a House manager who showed some riveting uh, testimony or uh, video, if you will, uh, like many of the video Dan just referred to with the vice president being escorted out. But this one regarding Chuck Schumer. Going up the ramp with his detail, he'll soon go out of view. Seconds later, they return and run back down the hallway, and officers immediately shut the door and use their bodies to keep them safe. At 2.45 p.m., shortly after senators were ushered to safety from the Senate floor, insurrectionists reached this Senate gallery.
The following video was filmed by a New Yorker reporter. Minutes later, the insurrectionists invaded and desecrated the Senate floor. These vandals shouted and rifled through the desks in this room. They took pictures of documents and of themselves, celebrating that they had taken over the floor and stopped the counting of electoral college votes. Dan, there was so much there, including another clip that they played with Mitt Romney, who was literally walking right into the direction of where the insurrectionists were. And that police officer, I believe his last name may be Goodman, I forget, but actually ran towards mm -hmm. them yep. and diverted them into a different direction. You see Mitt Romney literally running away. I mean, it, it was just so powerful. And the way, as Julie put it, we all know as prosecutors, even as defense lawyers, we love timelines, 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 where all the things are being put into place of what's going on. I'm told from all the news accounts that the Republicans who seem lackadaisical about this actually were sitting up, paying attention and kind of shaking their heads in disbelief when they were watching and actually afterwards said the House managers did an awesome job. What are your overall thoughts? Even if it may not be a conviction, they certainly were moved. And I think most of the public was, too. Yeah, they presented as strong a case as possible. And as you said, timeline evidence is very important. Video evidence is so powerful because you can actually see what happened. In addition to the clips you showed, they showed officers being struck by the assailants. They showed the one officer who was being crushed between two doors and screaming for help. And then you see Senator Romney, Senator Schumer fleeing right when rioters are in their area. So that is overwhelming evidence to actually see it happening. And then to show the timeline of what former President Trump was doing and saying at the same time. So that is critical here. It is amazing when you watch that video that more life wasn't lost because so many people had close calls with people who were clearly intent on causing violence to people. Yeah. And, and you're right, Dan and Julie, they were making a specific point that they had and gave a compelling argument that these people were out to kill multiple people, including Schumer, Nancy Pelosi, and Vice President Pence. It is a bipartisan insurrection. Bipartisan people were being attacked, and they could have completely dismantled the highest levels of our government. I, I, I still find myself surprised that there are some that can at least recognize, irrespective of partisan politics, and how this can just not be condoned ever, ever again. Well, it's funny, you know, one of the things you talked about is, you know, proving the intent on the part of former President Trump when he made the statements or failed to make certain statements, made the video, made, you know, all the comments on Twitter. And you know, and I know, and Dan knows um, that when it comes to proving intent, it's very rare that a person just shouts out, please go into the Capitol and kill everyone in sight. And so mm -hmm. the law allows you to look at what a person does before, during and after the incident and what is caused by what you do. And so if we look at each thing that President Trump did, not from the day before, but from weeks, from months before, where he had his group, his people understanding and believing before anything happened that there was going to be an unfair um, voting decision against him. And if you take that into the time when they, they came into the Capitol, you realize that he basically completely set in motion every single moment that happened on that day and what happened after. Julie, you make an excellent point about what we do as prosecutors when we have to prove a case beyond a reasonable doubt, a standard that does not exist here. They make their own standards up. And what a great job they did, to your point, at showing the before, during, and after, and how violence had been following many of these tweets, and he was aware of it and was actually not doing anything to discourage it. Great points, guys. Uh, we got some more stuff on the other end of the break, including uh, the football player who is now no longer working with the football team. He was fired after assaulting his girlfriend. We have developments from the girlfriend herself. We'll be right back. And I, I remember getting up and running to the bathroom. Chad was standing by the bed, by the doorway, and he was sipping his smoothie. And was like, wow, you're, you're still alive. Please help me now. I'm gonna die. 
Taylor says she then locked herself in the bathroom, called 911, and texted her family and Wheeler's father for help. According to police reports, it took three officers and two sets of handcuffs to restrain Wheeler. Iowa Wheeler's been cut from the team uh, and actually gave a very impassioned and what some believe heartfelt response that he has to deal with some mental health issues. What I found interesting, Dan, about this is that there, there were serious injuries here. She claimed she blacked out twice, and this is when she woke back up again. He was sipping that smoothie and saying, wow, you're still alive. Uh, she had a concussion, bolts uh, put in her steel plate in her arm. The pair had dated for about six months. And on the date of the incident, uh, Dan, she claimed that he had shaved his head and that he loved his hair. And she was really shocked at that. And she thought that he was decompensating in some way and that he had bipolar disorder. And then the next thing you know, he's asking her to bow. She refuses to bow. And then he throws her on the bed and starts to choke her. Um, so I guess as a defense lawyer, I, I you it's you go for the mental health defense. Certainly rehabilitation and, and treatment will be important, but it's a pretty serious domestic violence case that I would imagine prosecutors are going to take kind of seriously. What do you think? Yeah, it's frightening. I'm a former domestic violence prosecutor. And as far as his apology, we hope it's sincere. But I just want to say that I've seen in hundreds of these cases that there's a cycle of violence where there's a violent incident. And then right after that, the perpetrator makes this seemingly heartfelt apology where they say they don't do it again. And often that's used to get the victim back in their lives. And then often in these cases, we see a pattern of this honeymoon period where things are okay, and then a reescalation of violence until the next incident. So the apology happens in almost all of these cases. What, ha what happens after that is really more important, whether he really does change his life and isn't violent again. But what he did here, seemingly almost taking someone's life, is frightening, and he certainly should be prosecuted for that at a minimum. Julie, uh, the victim made what I thought was an interesting and very balanced comment about the mental health issue. And she made an observation that she doesn't doubt that he's got a mental health issue, but she doesn't know really whether or not that was what was at play, because when the police came, he was nothing but kind and good to them and following and obeying orders. And we know from the psychiatric world, I'm not a psychologist, nor are you, but we've we've interviewed enough that you don't have those kind of like sudden stops and starts. So she uh, is kind of indicating, I don't know, maybe these apologies are just feigned. Yeah, I, I did read somewhere, and I, I, again, I, you know, don't hold me to it, but my understanding was he was also aggressive with the police officer. So I'm not sure that she's accurate, mm -hmm. but I may not be accurate. And I, you know, I go to what Dan was talking about. I think, you know, it's true. You know, it's so hard for me as a defense attorney now and a former prosecutor, because I have so many clients that have been involved with violent crimes that have serious, serious mental health issues. And how do we balance their mental health issues with the idea of what the punishment should be? And I think one of the things to look at in this case, which I think that the prosecutor and the defense will be doing, is A, looking back to see if there has been violence in the past. Has that violence been uh, impacted because of mental health issues? Does he really have mental health issues or is this just simply an excuse? Is it drugs? Is it something else? Is he just a violent guy? And I think there's so much more investigation that needs to be done to make a determination, you know, as Dan said, is in the future, is he going to be um, dangerous? Uh, because look, if you go through the process of getting all the mental health you need and you still can't refrain from being violent, then that's a different story that someone, if they're taking uh, the minimal amount of medication, you know, can, you know, be safely rerouted into the community. So I think time will tell with regards to this. Okay, guys, let's switch gears <clears throat> real quick. We have a hundred year old Nazi uh, who worked at a concentration camp as a guard, committed uh, numerous Holocaust crimes. German prosecutors have charged this uh, SS corrections guard with aiding and abetting the murder of 3,518 souls. Dan, I mean, this is like unbelievable. Hundred year old guy. Um, they're they're not stopping the pursuit of justice and going after these people that have committed these atrocities. But I found something in in reading these articles that I thought was kind of interesting. Last year, there was a former concentration camp guard that was given a two year suspended sentence um, when he worked with the SS and aided and abetted the murder of five thousand two hundred and thirty two people, which is more than this particular guy. I was kind of shocked at that sentence. But what do you think overall about this? 
Yeah, I saw that information also. Maybe it depended on what specific actions that other person took, but certainly it's it's a very important move to still prosecute people, even if they are 100, no matter what, because there's no statute of limitations for murder, and in this case, the murder of thousands. So if he is really responsible, he needs to be brought to justice. And instead of people feeling, oh, he's too old and feeling bad for him being prosecuted at 100, he should be fortunate and feel fortunate that he got to live the rest of his life which the other people that he allegedly murdered did not get to do. So this is certainly something that needs to be done. And it also sends a message to other people who are bad actors in the world that hopefully justice will catch up to them at some point. Yeah, your thoughts, Julie? Yeah, I mean, look, you can run, but you can't hide. And one of the things I noted was, you know, I'm sure you both noticed that they talked about the fact that he can sit for trial only for a couple hours a day. And as far as I'm concerned, I don't care if it's a couple minutes a day. Um, I think it's incredibly important. Um, and again, these are allegations, but if in fact they're true, it's so important for him to be held responsible for his actions in the absolute abhorrent atrocities that, by the way, have impacted every single one of us. My family was impacted, and you know, many of the people in long crimes families as well. Yeah, Julie, let me just uh, ask you about that. And, and I know I, I don't mean to be controversial when I ask this question, but um, there's been a lot that's been going on in the media about the idea of comparing what happened during the insurrection, the uh, uh, propaganda, the use of uh, you know false narratives, identifying a group of people to hate for all of your problems to the Nazi Germany scenario. And we obviously understand there's no comparison between the carnage that was ultimately created against the race of people in Germany. But are, are, are you offended by those, by those analogies, being a Jewish person yourself? Um, it's a good question, and I haven't really, you know, it's funny, I was reading about it the other day, and I think the thing that stood out to me is, um, you know, a, a recent show where someone was taken off the show for comments she had made, and and one of the responses was one of the male actors on the show had said the exact same thing, and he was still on the show. And so why were they beat? What, what was the disparity? Um, it, it's hard for me because I'm very sensitive about the topic, um, and so I try to kind of delineate whether it's my sensitivity that's causing me to feel anger or offense, or is it reality that should I feel offended when those comparisons uh, are made? And uh, I'll be honest, I haven't kind of come to an answer yet. So it's something I'm really kind of still processing. Yeah, no, very interesting. I appreciate your candor. Dan, I want to ask you the same question um, mm -hmm. because I was a, a student, actually, I minored in Nazi Germany because I was actually fascinated how a, a, a country could be taken over by a demagogic figure to do horrible, hateful, and terrible things that they probably never would have thought of prior to that, but because of the fear and the propaganda and whatever psychology or psychopathy goes into this can, of course, do that horrible thing. There's no comparison to the carnage, but should we be learning lessons from that? Should we be drawing parallels about what's happening now and what could happen in the future? Or is that an unfair? Uh, analogy to bring forward, or is it offensive? Well, you certainly have to learn lessons. And one of the big slogans of the Jewish people, and I'm a Jewish person after the Holocaust, was never again. We can never let this happen again. And part of never again is learning lessons from it and, and protecting the world from this happening again and recognizing warning signs. And one of those warning signs we need to be aware of is that people who are stirred up to hatred, to anger, mm -hmm. to scapegoating, will sometimes do violent, dangerous things in the name of those if they are driven to do so by a horrendous leader. That has not happened to the degree of the Holocaust since then, and we need to be vigilant to make sure it never happens again. Yeah, but it, some could, yeah, not great points, guys. And But some could make it, it could happen to the overthrow of a government. I mean, when the Nazi regime started, that that's essentially, they went through the democratic process in order to amp people up. And, and ultimately he became the, ch the chancellor and then wound up taking over by ab abandoning laws, making sure lawyers and judges, you know, owning and co-opting. I mean, we see so many kind of use of the prosecutorial system, the use of abuse of judges um, to make these kind of parallels. So of course the damage is nowhere near the same, but the institutional damage to the country, Julie, um, could have could have serious repercussions. I mean, are we, should we learn from any of this and what's recently happened to us in this country? Well, I, I, I mean, it, yes, um, and I, I don't think it, it's not about like when we talk about comparing. Yes, the atrocities of what happened in the Holocaust are overwhelming compared, if, if, as far as I'm concerned, in terms of the carnage than what happened um, recently. 
but you're always supposed to be vigilant. I I'll be honest. Um, I think that there's, you know, there's so much um, racism. There's so much anti-Semitism, um, you know, it, that is going on in this world that I think is is has grown to such an incredible degree over the past four years that for the first time in my life, I believe it's possible for something, maybe not exactly what happened in Germany, but for something to happen. Um, I have mm. children. I'm terrified. So you're damn right. I'm going to be paying attention. Um, and and I think everyone should be, um, because I think it's true. Mm. If you forget um, that that anything can happen again, um, and I'm certainly not going to allow it for my children. Excellent, guys. I really appreciate your candor with this. Well, we have to switch gears to Brian Ross, the great from the Law and Crime Network. He's got the uh, series Killer Cases, and we're going to show you a little bit of the new case he's going to be profiling, the Jason Carter case. It was a fascinating case. Let's take a listen. Nine one one. Where is your emergency? My mom. My mom was laying here on the floor. I said it had to be somebody that loved her. Is an Iowa son a seed of evil? It's a case of murder on the farm. She is gone because someone shot her. Yes, you did, Jason. And he told me that if I didn't get on the bus, that he was going to make sure I was under the bus. I asked why he didn't farm together with his dad. And his response was, I can't because my mom is a bitch. There's only two people in this world who know what happened on June 19, 2015. And one of them is dead, and the other one's sitting behind me. The killer is still out there that shot her! This is a really serious situation out of Pinellas County, Florida, where an individual hacked into the computer system that regulates the water system and actually had put into uh, the computer lie at a hundred times, that's lie of the chemical, the hundred times of what's uh, allowable and could have caused a catastrophic injury if it wasn't for the fact that an operator caught it in time and was able to stop that action from happening. Let's listen to the sheriff as he talks about this case. On Friday, uh, February 5th, uh, there was an unlawful intrusion into the city of Oldsmar computer system at its water treatment plant. Now, I'm going to provide you a little bit of background on how water is provided in Pinellas County. And there are some cities like Oldsmar uh, that access their own well fields, have their own water treatment plants, <clears throat> and provide drinking water directly to their city's businesses and residences. Other cities obtain their water from the county, which obtains water from Tampa Bay water. Because Oldsmar has its own well fields, it has to have its own water treatment plant that treats the water with chemicals so that it is suitable for public drinking. Water systems, like other public utility systems, are part of the nation's critical infrastructure and can be vulnerable targets when someone desires to adversely affect public safety. On Friday morning at about 8 o'clock, a plant operator at the Oldsmar Water Treatment Facility noticed that someone remotely accessed the computer system that he was monitoring. This computer system controls the chemicals and other operations of the water treatment plant. The computer system was set up with a software program that allows for remote access where authorized users can troubleshoot system problems from other locations. The remote access at 8 o'clock on Friday morning was brief, and the operator didn't think much of it because his supervisor and others will remotely access his computer screen to monitor the system at various times. The person remotely accessed the system for about three to five minutes, opening various functions on the screen. One of the functions opened by the person hacking into the system was one that controls the amount of sodium hydroxide in the water. The hacker changed the sodium hydroxide from about 100 parts per million to 11,100 parts per million. This is obviously a significant and potentially dangerous increase. Uh, sodium hydroxide, also known as lye, is the main ingredient in liquid drain cleaners. It's also used to control water acidity and remove metals from drinking water in the water treatment plants. After the intruder increased the parts per million from 100 to 11,100, the intruder exited the system and the plant operator immediately reduced the level back to the appropriate amount of 100. 
Now, Dan, from what I'm reading in these articles, this computer system that the hacker was able to get through was no longer in use. It was still on the system, um, but somehow mm -hmm. it, it, there was a back door to it and they were allowed to get into the system through that antiquated computer software program that they had. But Dan, what is happening here? We still have forgotten, because it seems like forever ago that we had a major breach of our intelligence computers a foreign actor, domestic terrorists, but these computers seem really vulnerable lately. Is that just in my imagination or are we dropping no, the ball? Is there anything we can do? Well, hackers are getting more sophisticated and I've investigated a lot of these hacking cases. And I want to say people imagine um, sophisticated, complicated ways to break through a firewall. And in fact, most of these hackings occur because someone was able through phishing or some other plan to get someone's password or get someone's access to a computer and use someone else's access to a system. And that's really the bigger vulnerability in a lot of these systems. And I read that that's one thing they're investigating here, that with someone else's access credentials given, because that's often the way that one of these people, and these hackers are very sophisticated in their schemes and their tricks to get someone else's credentials. But this is something that state actors, private sector people, all sorts of bad actors across the world are trying to infiltrate systems. And they could do it from anywhere and they could have horrendous consequences. Fortunately, in this case, this was detected by someone in the government who stopped the bad um, chemicals from going through the water, but this could have been much worse than it was, and we need to learn from this. Dan, talk to our audience just as a kind of a public service announcement about what phishing is and what to look out for and what happens if you wind up clicking onto one of these things. Uh, I'm told that sometimes these viruses can be laying dormant in your computer for a year, two years before they decide to activate. Just talk to us a little bit about the sophistication of that. Right, well, one big thing is not clicking on links or going onto any um, attachments that you don't know about that don't seem to be from someone you know about. Anyone asking for your password, so if someone sends you an email and it looks like it's from Amazon and they say, we need to um, reset your account, please log on here so we could do so. And then you go on to a link that might not be the real Amazon, you type in your password, and then all of a sudden someone else has your password. And maybe for a lot of people you use the same password for Amazon, for your bank, for all sorts of other things. And then the bad actor all of a sudden can log on to everything you have. So if, if Bob, I wanted to get access to your email, your bank, I could either try to hack into your computer through some technological means, or I might just try to get you through an email to give up your password inadvertently not realizing you were giving it to me, thinking you were giving it to someone who you were supposed to give it to, and then I could use that password for all sorts of other things. Or people sometimes just put their pet's name as a, as a password and other people guess what um, their pet's name with a number and they try all sorts of different numbers. And that's how people are really hacking into people's accounts. And in this case, we don't know how it happened, but a lot of times these breaches are because someone's credentials were infiltrated and used. Yeah, and Julie, I mean, it's one thing to get into critical infrastructure sites like a water treatment facility, but I recently did a lecture with a computer expert who does a lot with this kind of stuff that Dan is talking about, who actually went on the black, the dark web, uh, and I never really knew exactly what the dark web was or how you get there or whatever, but he's got those access credentials, and he took all of the attendees that were at the um, seminar and found incredible amounts of information that were actually pilfered from their computers, put on the dark web, and apparently are sold. Um, and some of this stuff is pretty frightening. Um, and I know you're a very sophisticated computer user yourself, and that would never happen. Um, but we're seeing more and more of these kind of crimes. Have you ever had any cases that dealt with clients that were charged with this? Yeah. By the way, you know, the the the, the system was, I think, TeamViewer, which I think a lot of I've used TeamViewer in the past. And the only difference is they had left it on their computer for six months. I, you know. I, I want to just cover one thing, um, which is that, you know, they infiltrated um, potentially had this person not caught it an entire community's water. Can you just imagine the terroristic threat that exists if this could happen in multiple communities? Um, and it doesn't seem to have been very difficult for whoever did this, the hacker, to get into that system. Um, and so it shouldn't be that pure luck enabled someone to catch it. Um, and so when we think about all the prior terroristic threats that have happened, water supply is one of the biggest concerns that all of us should have. And that's why I think this case is being investigated to such a, a degree, including I, I, I think the Secret Service is even involved in it. Um, and so that's what I take away from this case. And I think it's terrifying. 
Yeah, I, I, I could tell you for a certain thing, Homeland Security, JTTF, all the federal authorities are going to be on top of this because I, we want to know who this person is and what other connections he has to anyone else that may be involved in this. So uh, I am confident there is going to be a massive federal response to this. Guys, let's just switch gears a little bit. New Jersey's native son, Bruce Springsteen, is charged with a DUI out of Sandy Hook, New Jersey. That is a federal property that he was on. So the charge is actually held in the federal court, and they're going to be the ones that are going to determine, actually, you know, the judge who handles those cases, as to whether or not the charges filed against him, which also include reckless driving and consuming alcohol in a closed area, will be um, how they'll be prosecuted and how they'll be handled. Julie, I want to go to you first on this, because from the reports that we're reading, the blood alcohol content that was measured by the ALCO test, or was known as the breathalyzer or breathing machine, was a 0 0.02, according to the reports we're reading, and the limit is 0 0.08, so it was far below the limit. Do you have any thoughts or suggestions as to what you think may be the reason why he was charged with a DUI ticket when he fell below that standard? Hearing conflicting reports, I read the same thing. At one point, I read 0.08. Now I'm reading 0.02. It is possible that his behavior um, warranted, or they believe that his behavior warranted more investigation. I.e., is it possible he was using drugs? Is it possible the breathalyzer was wrong and he had uh, drank more? There is some allegations that he had taken a sip um, of a fan's drink uh, right before, you know, getting, you know, onto his bike. I think one of the things that stood out is someone commented that they should have just given him a break um, because he's an actor. I think that was a comment from one of his fans. I don't expect an actor or anyone famous to get a break, but I also don't expect them to be treated more severely because mm. they are, um, you know, someone in the popular eye. So I'm curious to see what the investigation is going to reveal, because if at the end of the day he's got a point oh two, I'm not I, I think, you know, with all due respect, I think all of us um, might be taken into custody pretty soon. Well, speak for yourself there, Ms. Rendleman. Um, <laughs> and I'm a Dan, Dan, I think I, I advise you to take the fifth as well. Well, Dan, I take to, the to fifth. Truly, <laughs> well, we just got a personal insight into Ms. Rendleman's life. And I'm, <laughs> I'm kidding. But I'm, I'm kidding. I, I'm kidding. I, I, I agree too, though. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with the thing you said, Julie. Dan, one of the things that based on the cases that I handle on the defense side that I see a lot, and again, we're only speculating right now is that the cops would not issue a ticket for a 0.02. But to Julie's point, I've handled the defendant cases where people go and they think they're under the influence, bloodshot eyes, watery eyes, fumbling, can't do field sobriety testing correctly, so on, so forth, and the other. And so they bring them in, the person goes on the machine, and they blow zeros. Then typically what happens at that point in time is if the officer still believes that the person is under the influence, they try to get consent for either blood or urine, and if they can't get consent for blood or urine and they think they have probable cause, they try to get a warrant for it. So, I mean, that could be what's going on in the background here, because if these guys issued a ticket for a 0 0.02 only, we know what the end result of that's going to be. And it's called dismissal. Right. I'd, I'd be surprised if someone went for a blood warrant in a case like this. I, when I was a prosecutor in New York City, we'd ask for blood warrants when there was a, a, a potential fatality because of a drunk driving accident and they, they wanted the blood alcohol content of the person who drove the car. For someone who is nonviolent from all reports, who blew a 0.02, I'd be really surprised if they went ahead to get a, a blood warrant, although if they had probable cause, certainly they could. There must have been, you would think, and you would hope, other factors that led to this arrest, because if it's just based on them thinking that he's intoxicated, but he really just has a 0.02, then the arresting officers made a mistake in arresting here. But that's why we have due process. That's why we have great defense uh, attorney is like Julie, and I'm sure he'll have a great defense attorney to challenge the evidence, and and then he'll have his day in court if he goes forward with that. Well, Bob Bianchi is here, ready, willing, and able to represent the boss who we used to listen to as we drove down the, the parkway to go to the Jersey Shore back in the day, as I told you guys before, when I had a full head of hair and a flat belly. But anyway, guys, we're going to take a little bit of a break here, but when we come back, if the, if the Derek Chauvin, i.e. George Floyd case could get any stranger, how about minority officers in the jail filing a lawsuit over something very interesting? We'll talk about it on the other end. Good afternoon. I'm Hennepin County Attorney Mike Freeman. I'm here to announce that former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin is in custody. 
Former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin has been charged by the Hennepin County Attorney's Office with murder and with manslaughter. Okay, guys, I've said this so many times before. This is going to be the case that's going to keep on giving and all sorts of twists and permutations. So a, a eight minority officers at the Minnesota County Jail facility where Chauvin is being housed pending trial uh, for the murder of George Floyd have filed a lawsuit. And they indicated that a superior officer told them that they could not have any contact or interaction with Chauvin and, in fact, removed them from their responsibilities completely from the floor that Chauvin was on. These people indicate, these officers, that they felt humiliated and distressed and that they went to a lawyer and now a lawsuit has been filed. They also allege that they saw a lieutenant, a white lieutenant, who was giving aid and comfort and special treatment to Chauvin up to and including going into his cell, sitting on his back, sitting on his bed, patting his back to comfort him. The officers say, uh, guys, I want to go to you with this real quick. I mean, the uh, Dan, uh, the idea that these officers are filing this complaint and you've done Title IX work and you've done some discrimination stuff and mm -hmm. investigations. Uh, it was interesting after they were asked for comment. The department didn't want to comment, but then after the suit was filed, I believe, or after they were called onto the carpet or when it was being investigated, indicated this officer, the one who, who ordered them off the floor, that they were doing this to protect and support the minority officers by shielding them from Chauvin. I'm calling, I don't believe it. <laughs> what are your thoughts? Well, we, look, whenever we discuss important cases, we always say these are charges, these are allegations. We don't know all the facts yet. But that being said, if officers are reassigned from a certain assignment solely because of their minority status, then that is illegal discrimination. It's very clear cut. If the only reason that they aren't guarding him or interacting with him is because they are minorities, then that is illegal and they have a right to sue. And they'll probably win that suit if those are the facts. Maybe there's another side to this, but you can't pick and choose in law enforcement or anywhere else who's going to have what responsibility based on the color of one's skin or one's ethnicity. That is very clear cut in the law. Okay, well, Julie, let me, I, I, and I'm going to play devil's advocate with this. These were black officers, Hispanic officers, pan-Asian, you know, people. Uh, it was a, a whole, people who were of mixed race, according to the reports that we're getting. I'm just curious, is, is there, it is a jail facility. They have a lot of control over what they do. But if they were to see a risk to their officers, like, i.e., I was thinking the argument was going to be not that we didn't want to have to put you in contact with him, but we didn't want a false accusation to be made should he be injured or, God forbid, something happen that you did this because of some racial reason. I'm not saying it's a justifiable legal reason. It could, it's probably foolhardy, but that would have been a better explanation to me than the one we got. Well, if that explanation in any way, shape or form had been made prior to the lawsuit, then maybe we would be having that discussion. But it wasn't. I mean, you, you must realize and I think we can all agree that there are certain people um, that are more vulnerable when they go to jail. We know we talk about like when a, when it's someone who is accused of pedophilia goes to jail, we want to protect them, protective custody. When law enforcement goes to jail, there are special you know, there are special circumstances because they are arguably more in danger, particularly an individual accused as Chauvin is of this specific crime. But when you delineate based on the color of the skin, as far as I'm concerned, who's going to be of? I, I understand what you're saying, but I think it's the opposite. I think who's going to be at risk of doing something to Derek Chauvin? Then it is incredibly offensive, racist, and it can't be accepted. And so I'm not mm. sure how you can argue that only white uh, individuals in the correctional facility can protect him when there's absolutely, yeah. it, it'd be one thing if one of the officers um, who was of color had indicated some type of venomous towards Chauvin, but unless you can show that, there's absolutely no basis to have done this. Yeah, Dan, it'd be like saying that white officers shouldn't be guarding uh, black people. It actually mm -hmm. is saying that they would somehow, because of the color of their skin, they're not able to fulfill their obligation under their oath uh, to properly do what they were supposed to do. I, just any thoughts about where this is going to go and what kind of damages would occur here? we got a limited period of time, but is this going to be a good case? And if so, how much? Well, look, if, yeah, then you have to figure out damages and how much they were hurt and also what a court wants to do in terms of punishing people. But the, the one big thing here is the whole case relies on the credibility of law enforcement. And 
What Derek Chauvin's accused of doing and what we saw horrifically on video undermined law enforcement's credibility throughout the country. And now if mm. these allegations are true, that people assigned to guard him are being removed because of their race, that further undermines law enforcement's credibility. And that's very damaging to society. So these are really serious allegations. If, if mm. they're true, I assume there'll be some kind of damages issued and that'll have to be calculated. Okay, I completely agree, guys. You were awesome guests. Thank you very much. That's it for me for the week. You can find me at RBianchi ESQ. Stay tuned for our regularly scheduled programming. I will be back next Monday. I hope you all have a great weekend.